Lord Glenartha, we referred yesterday but didn't look at um, your uh, parliamentary answer on the 14th of July. So I want to start this morning with that. Thank you. Um, Shomik, it's DHSC 000-2229 underscore 085. Um, so we can see the date's the 14th of July, 1983. Um, there's a question posed by Baroness Dudley, top uh, left-hand side. And then we see you answering as follows. My Lord's 14 confirmed cases of AIDS have been reported to the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre at Collindale, and a further two cases are under investigation. On the basis of the information available to us, there are some 60 cases within other member states of the Council of Europe. The Medical Research Council has established a working party and coordinate research into the disease. The Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre is operating a national surveillance system which includes making available a summary of information for doctors about the incidents, identification and methods of control of the disease. Although there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted by blood or blood products, the department is considering the publication of a leaflet indicating the circumstances in which blood donations should be avoided. Now, just pausing there before we look at the rest of the, the, um, the short um, uh, session. The first sentence of the second paragraph referring to the Medical Research Council Working Party. Um, as I understand it, and if I'm wrong, we'll look at the documents, but I'm hoping I can just take this quite shortly because your statement deals with it. Um, is it right that it transpired that as at the 14th of July, what you'd said there was inaccurate because it hadn't been established at that point in time, but it was established in the course of the second half of 1983, that working party? I believe that is correct because I've seen other papers to indicate uh, that um, that is the case, but um, that uh, sentence was in the brief, the approved answer, and so I had no reason to disbelieve that what was written there was incorrect. Yes. And I, I think you put the precise date in your statement. We can check it if need be. Um, but uh, it was later, in fact, in the year that that, that working party was actually established. Um, and then uh, the last sentence of that paragraph, you'll see there the formula, no conclusive evidence. I'm going to come back to that um, in, in, in just a moment. But if we look at what's said then uh, thereafter, Baroness Dudley asks whether there's a cure on the way. Um, you say, up to the moment, it's not proved possible to identify exactly what's causing the disease. Until that has happened, I'm afraid I could not say that we can produce a cure. There's then a question about um, whether, any, from Baroness Gardner, whether any special action is being taken to inform dental and medical practitioners of precautions they should take. Um, and she raises a concern about the possibility of dentists, doctors, or, or other patients becoming infected. Um, you then uh, answer that by saying, I do not know the answer concerning dental surgeons specifically, but the mechanisms by which the disease is transmitted and the causative agent are not known. Although promiscuous male homosexual activity and intravenous drug abuse are risk factors, there's no evidence that the disease can be transmitted through non-physical contact. Um, and then Baroness Mash imposes this question. My lords, may I ask the noble lord why we import blood compounds from America? <coughs> And is there not a fear that this condition can be transmitted through antihemophiliac cryoprecipitate, which is a blood compound? And I draw attention to that because that's what I think triggers you writing to Baroness Masham, that, that yes, particular question. that's correct. Uh, I think it must be antihemophilic. Yes. Uh, but it, it is actually spelled as antihemophiliac, yes. which is a, 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 <laughs> obviously completely yes. wrong. <laughs> Spelling mistake. Um, and then top of the next page, you say, my lords, I do not know the answer concerning the chemical to which the noble baroness referred. I shall find out and let her know. Um, so you, 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 she, she talked about cryoprecipitate and you didn't know what the position was in relation to that at this point in time. I certainly couldn't recall it when I was answering the question. But, uh... um, you, you say, I shall find out and let her know. And then you, you refer to factor eight. Um, um, we, have, we have to import factor eight, which is an agent used in the cure for haemophiliacs. <coughs> we shall need to continue to do that until we're self-sufficient ourselves. And then Baroness Gardner asks this, may I ask him whether it's now believed that this disease is transmissible in more, many more ways than originally believed? Will the minister issue instructions to practitioners or ask his department to look into the need to do so? Uh, and, and 
the answer you give is, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, my lords, I will do that. So the question of issuing information or instructions to practitioners is expressly raised, and, and, and you say that you'll, you'll um, consider that. Uh, and then the questions posed by Baroness Masham, um, why do we have to import blood compounds from America, why we cannot manufacture our own? And your answer is we need to import because we've not got enough ourselves. We're trying to build up our own stocks. The noble baroness might like to know that last year, BPL manufactured 22 million international units of factor eight. At the same time, we imported 35 million international units in 1981 at a cost between three million pounds and four million pounds. Um, so th those are the questions and answers that took place on the 14th of July. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the response to Baroness Masham and, yes. and the written letter in okay. a moment. I just want to look at a number of other occasions over the next few months when the words no conclusive evidence or no conclusive proof were used. Yes. So I think that's the first time you use it. Um, we then um, have DHSC 0002231 underscore 036. Um, so this is a letter um, written by you, 26th of August, 1983, to Clive Jenkins, who was the sorry. Can we just go to the top of the page again, shall we? Who was the general secretary of uh, a major trade union, the Association of Scientific, Technical, and Managerial Staffs, ASTMS. Um, you're responding, as we can see from the first paragraph, to a letter Mr. Jenkins had written to Lord Treff Garn, who was is this right? Um, a, a minister prior to you in the House of Lords? He was the, um, yes, he was the House of Lords minister. He was the joint parliamentary secretary immediately preceding me. And, and is this correct, that that letter of the 7th of July from Mr Jenkins to Lord Trefgarn is another one of the documents that can't be located? Uh, I, that, I understand that to be the case. Yes, um, and as I understand it, the, the government legal department hasn't found it and the inquiry hasn't found it. So. Right. Um, and then you say this, I think that I should emphasise, firstly, that there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted through blood products. Nevertheless, we're taking all practicable measures to reduce any possible risks to recipients of blood and blood products. Our scope for action in this is limited, as there's no means of testing for the presence of AIDS in blood donors or in blood products. And then you go on to deal with a number of other matters. And again, I'm going to come back to, to, to this letter. I just want to look at this, the, 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 the formula of no conclusive evidence, first of all. Um, so that's 26th of August. Um, if, if we then look um, uh, at the letter to Baroness Masham, um, DHSC 0002231 underscore 037. Next page. Oh, sorry, actually, we'll just pick it up on this page first of all. We can see your, your, um, someone in your private office uh, writing to Mr. Wynne Stanley, um, <clears throat> saying, Lord Glenarth has seen your minute of the 26th of August and has written as drafted. I attach a copy of the final reply. Um, that would tend to suggest that the, you, you've essentially signed and sent off the draft that had been sent by Mr. Wynne Stanley. That's correct. Uh, and then if we go to the next page. Um, so this is 30th of August, 1983, to Baroness Masham. Um, um, again, we'll come back to it in more detail, but if we go just slightly further down, thank you. So if we look at the third paragraph, you say, there is, in fact, no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood, cryoprecipitate, or factor concentrates. And then you go on to talk about uh, dependency on imports from the USA for factor eight and, and, and the, the Food and Drug Administration issue and so on. So again, we'll, we'll come back to that. So that's the third time I think you use a phrase of no conclusive evidence, no conclusive proof. In case it matters, this is a slightly different formulation. There's no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood, as opposed to the previous one, which is AIDS is transmitted by blood. Yes. Uh, it may be necessary to come back to that. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yes, possibly. We'll, 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 we'll look at the, the issue of that line um, in, in more detail in a few minutes. Um, so that was, that's the 30th of August. If we then go to DHSC 0006401 underscore 006, please. Um, now, now, this is um, 
um, a press release, um, and it's uh, setting out a statement that's coming from Kenneth Clark rather than from you, uh, but this is, I think, a document you'd have seen in advance. We looked at the history of the leaflet yesterday, yes. and this is announcing the first leaflet and, and, and um, on the 1st of September 1983. Um, so although you're not saying these words, so to speak, Mr. Clark is, um, it's a document that came across your desk. Uh, and we can see in the second paragraph, it says, announcing publication, Kenneth Clark, Minister for Health, said, it has been suggested that AIDS may be transmitted in blood or blood products there is no conclusive proof that this is so. Uh, nevertheless, I can well appreciate the concern that this suggestion may cause, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it goes on then to talk about the issue of the leaflet. Um, uh, then the fifth document is at ARCH 40679, please. Um, this is a, a letter that was written by you on the 16th of December 1983, mm -hmm. and it's to John Maples, MP. And you're responding to a letter which had been written to Mr. Clark. Thank you for your letter of the 2nd of November, addressed to Kenneth Clark about AIDS and the supply of blood products in this country. I don't think we've got the letter of the 2nd of November in the materials available um, today, but this is a letter written, as you would expect, on behalf of a constituent um, by Mr. Maples ra raising an issue and, and, and you're responding. Um, and then you say this in the second paragraph, I can well appreciate the anxiety, particularly amongst haemophiliacs and their families, which recent press reports on AIDS may have caused, and would first of all like to put matters into perspective. The cause of AIDS is as yet unknown, and there is no conclusive proof that the disease has been transmitted by American blood products. And then you say, nevertheless, I'd like to assure your constituent that the government's committed to making this country self-sufficient in blood products, and you go on to give more details about various matters, including <coughs> the redevelopment of BPL. So th those are five occasions in the second half of 1983, from July through to December, um, when th this phrase is used, it, in slightly different ways, as the, the, the chair observes. Four of these occasions, the, the words are written by or spoken by you. Or, on one of them, the press statement, uh, it, it, it's Mr. Clark. Um, now, what I want to start with then is look at the drafting process in relation to the first um, matter, uh, um, sorry, the, the, uh, the letter to Baroness Masham. Yes. Because I don't think we have a detailed understanding of the drafting process in relation to the other communications. In relation to the 14th of July parliamentary answer, I think as we touched on yesterday and as your statement says, we don't have the briefing material or the drafts which show the origin of the parliamentary answer. No, we don't. So we only know what words you spoke, and you told us yesterday that would have been a draft provided to you through your office. Yes, it would. Um, but we do have a little bit of information about the process of drafting of the letter to Baroness Masham. So if we start with DHSC 0002229 underscore 096, please. Um, so we can see, um, uh, this is, a, if we, thank you, if we look at the whole letter, uh, it's a minute dated the 19th of July, 1983. It's from Mr. Joyce, your private secretary, um, to Mr. Parker, uh, and it refers to the parliamentary uh, question and answer on the 14th of July, and says this, you will see from the attached Hansard extract that Lord Glenarthur undertook to write to Baroness Masham about possible transmission through Factor Eight. I do not know there is much more we can say than to refer to the balance of risk to haemophiliacs and the development of production at the new Elstree lab, but Lord Glenarthur is concerned to allay Lady Masham's anxieties so far as possible. She is an energetic lobbyist. Uh, I have asked Miss Edwards to prepare a reply to Baroness Gardner's second supplementary. 
uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the, the second supplementary in a moment, but that's the question about the issuing of instructions or information to clinicians. Yes. Um, uh, so we can see if we just go back to the whole page, um, uh, um, it's copied to Miss Edwards, Dr. Wolford, uh, Dr. Sibelis, um, and then um, someone has written on it, Mr. Green, please let me have a draft, and uh, dated the 20th of July. Um, uh, and then uh, we have uh, a further handwriting, Mr. Parker, draft contribution and background note attached. Um, if we then look at DHSC 00002491 underscore 013, this is a minute from Dr. Wolford dated the 20th of July 1983 to Mr. Parker. Here with some wording for the reply by Lord Glen Arthur to Baroness Masham about the possibility of transmission of AIDS from anti-haemophiliac sick. So Dr. Wolford, it would appear, picked up the point that um, the, the chair made, yep. cryoprecipitate. Um, and then there are two paragraphs. The first is about cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitate is a crude extract of factor VIII and other proteins, which is made by freezing human plasma followed by thawing. After the plasma is thawed, a precipitate is left, which contains much of the factor VIII activity of the original plasma, etc., etc. Um, so a, a definition and explanation about what cryoprecipitate is. And then the second paragraph drafted by uh, Dr. Wolford reads as follows. There is no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood, cryoprecipitate or factor VIII concentrates. But the assumption is that such transmission may be possible. No cryoprecipitate for therapeutic use is imported into this country. So we can see from this that Dr. Wolford in her draft included... Yep. That sentence that we see in the final yes. letter, no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood, cryoprecipitate, or factor VIII concentrates. But she added the words, but the assumption is that such transmission may be possible. Yeah. You don't, I think, see this minute. So the drafting process, no, the exchanges didn't. between civil servants don't come to your private office. No, not, no that draft certainly didn't. Um, if we then look at DHSC 0002309 underscore 032, um, this is um, a minute dated the 26th of July of 1983. It's from Mr. Parker to uh, Mr. Joyce in your private office. We can see, if we just go further down the page... Um, it, it's copied to Miss Edwards, Dr. Wolford, Dr. Sibelis, Mr. Green. And then if we go up to the text, uh, it says this. We spoke about your minute of the 14th of July when you asked for a fairly full draft letter to Baroness Masham. I understand Miss Edwards is replying separately about Baroness Gardner's supplementary question, and you may wish to use her material to expand on my draft attached. I've not made reference to the AIDS leaflet since this was covered in Lord Glenarthur's reply to Baroness Dudley. And since I would suggest we say no more until ministers have had an opportunity to comment on the second submission, which I'm aiming to get to you by the end of the week, I'm also enclosing a background note prepared by Dr. Wolford on cryoprecipitate. And if we go over the page, we can see there um, uh, it's headed contribution to reply to Baroness Masham. And it's only, I think, the first paragraph that I need to ask you to look at. I should emphasise that there is no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood cryoprecipitate or factor VIII concentrates, full stop. And then it goes on to talk about the non-importation of cryoprecipitate but the dependency upon importation of factor concentrates. So that the rest of the qualification to the sentence that Dr. Wolford had drafted has been omitted from this draft, is that right? So it appears. So doing the best we can, reconstructing things from the documents, because I appreciate, I don't think you have an independent recollection of, 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 of this detail now. Um, uh, for, for reasons we, we don't know, the version that goes to Mr. Joyce and thus to you simply has the bald sentence, I should emphasise there's no conclusive proof. Yes. Um, uh, and, and is this right? You, you don't know why the other part of Dr. Wolford's draft was left out? I have, I have no idea. Uh, I suppose it is possible that it was considered by officials to be an extension of the 
uh, the standard line, no conclusive proof, which had first been generated, as far as I know, in the PQ for the Prime Minister. Yes. And that's when it first emerged as a, as a, as a, as a, as a term. Uh, I do remember the letter that I had to write to Lady Masson very well, because I knew her very well, saw a lot of her in the House of Lords, and I wanted to ensure that that letter was as full uh, and covered all the necessary elements of her original answer as possible. That's why I asked for it to be carefully done. I, I think there may have been an earlier draft, but I don't know if it ever appeared, which, um, which I didn't feel was full enough. That's when we went back to the case. And then if we just go to the next page, um, we then see separately what's described as the background <coughs> to Wolford, which is the, the description of cryoprecipitate. Yes. Um, if we look then at um, DHSC... 0001406 underscore 001. We can see again at your private office writing to Mr. Wynne Stanley, this time on the 23rd of August, yes. referring to Mr. Parker's minute and saying um, this Lord Glenarth has asked for the draft attached to be updated to incorporate the new information on the working party and about cryoprecipitate. Lord Glenarthur would like to send the letter off this week and I would be grateful for a new draft by the 26th of August. So that's a reference to what I think you just mentioned. You wanted some more information. Exactly. On it didn't cover all the points you'd asked about. Um, but you, you didn't, I think, raise any questions or, or, or ask for any further information about the no conclusive proof line. No, I, I didn't, uh, because that was the standard line. Uh, and I was not aware that there was an other element which had been added by Dr. Walford and removed by somebody else. And then if we go, I think we might have the draft um, or, or, or a, a, a draft letter. Um, DHSC 0001405. Um, 26th of August, um, uh, Mr. Winstan is writing back to your private office. I attach a revision of the draft you sent, expanded to include more detail on factor rate and cryoprecipitate, and to give the up-to-date picture on the publications of the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre and the position on research. I've also expanded on the position regarding factor rate from the USA. And if we go over the page, we can see then... Um, the, the draft uh, uh, and if we go further down again we, we see uh, the sentence there is in fact no conclusive proof that AIDS can be transmitted by blood cryoprecipitate or factor 8 concentrates again it, it's in what's now become the, the version of the letter um, without, still without Dr Wolford's qualification. That's correct. Um, I, I, I want to ask you... Just, just, just before we, we, leave, we leave this, are, are you going to come back to the last um, five or six lines on, on this draft? I'm certainly going to be coming back to the issue, sir. But then then I, I the shan't F ask any questions. The FDA recommendations Thank you. Korean Post March, yes. Um, look, looking at that material now, do, does it concern or trouble you that that... Um, Additional explanation by Dr. Wolford is that, that the assumption was was that, that um, transmission was a possibility has been omitted from the version that's sent to your office. Yes, it does, because I'm sure that during the discussions that I had with officials, and almost certainly with Dr. Wolford, I explored with her the reasons for the, the line that uh, had been generated, the no conclusive proof, and talked about that. And clearly here, uh, 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 as the, um, the expert in this field, she was trying to expand on um, no conclusive proof with the additional words, which made, in retrospect, a lot of sense to me. But um, uh, Mr. Wynne Stanley or somebody else in the department uh, it took it upon themselves to uh, remove that. Um, I don't know why they never referred it back to 
Dr. Walford to say no, uh, so that she could say, no, I really think it ought to go in, and if necessary, ministers have got to be consulted about whether it should go in. It wasn't added, uh, and I not, was not aware of it when, it when the final draft came to me for signature. It all looked reasonable, and it covered exactly the same point as it had been covered before. So I wasn't aware, and yes, it, in retrospect, it does trouble me. Um, uh, now, before we go on to look at um, the letter uh, to um, Mr Jenkins and, and the, the, the similar but not identical wording in, in the letter to that, just want to then pick up um, what was being drafted for you as the response to Baroness Gardner's second supplementary question. Yes. Um, if we go to DHSC 0002229 underscore zero nine five. Um, we can see um, on the 19th of July, um, a, a minute goes from Mr. Joyce to Miss Edwards. Um, do, do you know who Miss who Edwards is or was? No, I'm afraid I don't. Um, and it says, uh, you'll see from the attached Hansard extract that Lord Glenarthur replied to Baroness Gardner of Parks's second supplementary that he would ask his department to look into the need to issue instructions to practitioners. Lord Glenarthur feels that a written reply is implicit in this. I would therefore be grateful if you could let me have, by the 25th of July, a draft which tells Lady Gardner what the department is doing to promote practitioners' awareness and diagnosis of AIDS. I'm asking Mr Parker in HS to provide a draft in respect to Baroness Masham's point about transmission through factor eight, and that's the material we've just looked at. So Mr Joyce, it would appear, is asking Miss Edwards to um, uh, um, look into and then provide a draft response for you on this question of guidance to practitioners. Yes. Now, unfortunately, we cannot yet find yeah. Miss Edwards' response. So we don't know what information was provided um, directly by Miss Edwards, whether there were any qualifications, any further explanations or anything of the kind. We only know the text that then appears in the, the draft letter sent to you at the end of August and, and your final version. Um, so if we go back to Baroness Masham's letter... Can I, can I just yes, say, in, re, in, in relation to, um, to, to the uh, letter to Lady Gardner, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that had I not replied to the, the point that she raised I in the House of Lords, uh, she would have pursued me and asked me why I hadn't replied. Uh, again, she was someone I saw regularly, and uh, being a dentist, she had medical credentials. Uh, but uh, I, I don't recall her ever coming back to me but and asking it, why not. But, but it, well, the, the, the was a, this issue was covered in the letter to Baroness Masham. Yes. Um, I, 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 your point, I think, is why is there no separate letter to Baroness Gardner? Correct. Yeah, oh, I understand. Thank you. Um, um, I think you're right. There, there doesn't appear to be a separate letter to Baroness Gardner. Um, um, uh, if we go but then back to the letter to Baroness Masham, DHSC 0002231 underscore 036... And we go to the second page. Oh, no, sorry, yes. I've given you the wrong letter. That's the Jenkins letter. Um, sorry, Shay Mick. DHSC 0002231 underscore 037. And if we go to the next page, there's the letter to Baroness Masham. And if we go to the second page, Can we um, look in more closely at um, uh, that? So the second paragraph says this, and um, this appears to be the answer to Baroness Gardner's question, albeit, as you say, it's going in a letter to Baroness Masham rather than Baroness Gardner. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it says... Um, sorry, if we look at the first paragraph first, for my apologies, Shemek. I know you're concerned about the problems of age generally, and I thought you might find it useful and reassuring if I elaborated on the points I was able to make during questions. And then would you accept, Lord Glenarthur, that what we're looking at in the next paragraph is effectively addressing the question posed by Baroness Gardner? Uh, it, it appears to be that, yes. Uh, and it says this, we've been looking very carefully at our position on this matter. 
and our medical advisors consider that the publications which have already appeared in the medical press provide sufficient and adequate guidance and information about this disease for practitioners, given the present state of knowledge. As I indicated on the 14th of July, information about the incidence, identification and methods of control of the disease is available on request from the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre at Collindale. The centre has published in the Communicable Disease Report, which is issued to all medical officers for environmental health, and in the British Medical Journal of the 29th of July, further information under the title Surveillance of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome in the UK from January 1980 to July 1983. And then you go on to refer to the MRC Working Party on to coordinate research into AIDS, and then in the final paragraph you say, we shall, however, be keeping the matter under close review to see whether any further departmental action might be appropriate in due course, and I will let you know of any developments. So, um, Shemit, could we have two documents on screen, that page, and also um, DHSC 0002229 underscore 085. Sorry, uh, DHSC 0002229 underscore 085. It's the parliamentary question and answer. Um, so if we look um, uh, uh, at, at the question, first of all, from Baroness Gardner... Um, uh, will the minister issue instructions to practitioners or ask his department to look into the need to do so, is the question. And then if we look at the answer in the form of the letter to Baroness Masham, which is as close an answer as we get, would it be right to understand that essentially the response to the first part of Baroness Gardner's question, which is, will, will the department issue instructions to practitioners, although it doesn't say so in terms, is, is really no. You decide, the department decides not to issue any instructions or information to practitioners because what's set out here, our medical advisors consider that there's already sufficient ad and adequate guidance and information available. Uh, yes, but whether or not that particular letter was shared with Lady Gardner or whether or not, as is certainly the case now, um, that letters uh, to members of the House of Lords have shown an interest in a particular topic are copied to the library so that everyone can access to the, 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 the correspondence, I do not know. But, yeah. um, Um, if we go back to the question and answers, um, I'm asked to uh, I I invite attention to Baroness Gardner's first question, which is on the left-hand side of the column, um, um, on the right-hand side of the screen, which was whether any special action was taken to inform dental and medical practitioners of precautions they should take. You, you, you weren't looking at the screen and the wrong portion was highlighted, I think. No. No, no, no. I, I've been asked by the Lord Gardner's ah, Lord Arthur's uh, legal representatives to, to point out the first question from Baroness Gardner, although my understanding is that what was said was, was being asked to respond to was the second question. But in any event, um, the questions posed there about special action to inform dental and medical practitioners of precautions they should take. Uh, uh, um, so there we are. It's there. And then the second question posed by Baroness Gardner, we look at again. Uh, um, whether, may I ask him whether it's now believed that this disease is transmissible in many more ways than originally believed? Will the minister issue instructions to practitioners or ask his department to look into the need to do so? As far as you're aware, was anything done to look into that question any more than the request to Miss Edwards to provide a, an answer that we don't have and then your answer to Baroness Masham? Um, not that I'm aware of now, but um, the procedure was that um, any requests that had been made in a 
parliamentary question uh, by uh, those who who'd taken part would have been looked at by my private secretary and by the um, respective part of the department that was dealing with it and would have acted upon it or should have done. Um, whether or not they took that as the um, would I, uh, will, I will, will the minister issue instructions? That, that particular phrase would have, and I said, uh, yes, I will do that, would have gone into the department for them to handle that particular statement that I'd made. Yeah. Um, or ought to have done, anyway. Um, and then if we go back to the, the, to the letter on the left-hand side, and if we can just go back and look more closely <coughs> to that paragraph beginning, we've been looking very carefully. Um, th there are three sources of information there identified um, in this paragraph. The first is that information is available on request from the Communicable Di Disease Surveillance Centre. So would it be right to understand, and I, I know this is a draft prepared for you that you then send out, but it's sent out in your name, Lord Glenarthur, so um, I, I, there isn't anyone else I think I can ask about what, what's being yes. referred to here. W would you accept that the first bit of information that's being referred to is, is something that could potentially be obtained on request? So that's to say... If people want to get information, they can ask the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre. That is what it says, and that what I assume to be accurate. The, the second, then, is something referred to as the Communicable Disease Report. And what's said there is that's issued to all medical officers for environmental health. So, again, that's not something that goes to all clinicians, for example. It goes specifically to, to environmental health doctors. Apparently, yes. Um, and then the third is reference to a British Medical Journal article, um, a, a relatively recent one, 29th of July. And I, I don't know whether you can answer this or not, Lord Glenarthur, but, but when, when Miss Edwards' missing draft came back to Mr Joyce, um, with this kind, assuming it had this kind of detail in, which is what the assumption one is making, would, would you expect to have had provided to you samples of the material which is being referred to? So would you have expected Ms Edwards to provide to Mr Joyce a copy of the Medical Journal article or a sample of the Communicable Disease Report so that you could satisfy yourself that this was a proper and adequate answer to the issues raised by Baroness Gardner? Not necessarily, no. I, I was relying on the number of experts in that particular field to provide a fully accurate and complete, or as complete as it could be, uh, incorporated in one letter uh, set of information in order to pass that on to my correspondent. So you, you wouldn't routinely check for yourself as minister the content of this type of material that's being referred to? You would assume that that had been done for you, would you, by by those who are putting together the draft reply? Yes. Uh, 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 the same could be true of, you know, probably 20, 30, 40, 50 letters a day which had to be replied on a whole mix of subjects. So one couldn't uh, dissect in every, you know, uh, completely dissect the draft letter that had come up unless there was something pretty obvious in it that you needed to refer back to officials about. Um, so, yes, I'd have taken this on trust from people who I trusted. Um, um, so we, we can take those, those down, thank you. So, if, if we now come on to the use of no conclusive um, evidence in the letter to Mr Jenkins, um, DHSC 0002231 underscore 036, by way of reminder... And if we go back to that, that, that second paragraph um, beginning, I think I should emphasise firstly. Um, now, the, 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 the chair has, has pointed out that there's a difference of wording between some of the documents, which some talk about no conclusive evidence or, or proof that AIDS can be transmitted, and some say no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted. And some, some say may be transmitted, and some say has been transmitted. Um, do, do, do you recall um, noting that or thinking about it or considering that at the time? 
No, I don't. Uh, I, I think it was taken as meaning the same thing, and there were exactly the same thing, and there was just a different style in in uh, in the way that it was written. Um, and uh, perhaps these letters were drafted by individuals who used language slightly more loosely, but stuck to the main point that there was no conclusive either evidence or proof, and is or was. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how that arose. Um, 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 would you accept that in this letter, it, it's being um, the line is being put emphatically, is it not? You say, I think that I should emphasise, firstly, that there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted through blood products. Yes. Now, if we just pick up the thread, then, of, of the, the communications be between you and, and, and Mr Jenkins, I'm, I'm not going to go to all of them because they continue, I think, well into the next year. We'll just look at um, two further letters. Uh, um, DHSC 0002235 underscore 041... This is Mr. Jenkins' response to you of the 27th of October, 1983. He says in the first paragraph, last three lines of it, I would like to put on record my disagreement with a number of the statements made in your letter. Sorry, I should read that whole sentence. I've been making a number of detailed inquiries among ASTMS experts on this issue, and I would like to put on record my disagreement with a number of the statements made in your letter. And the first that he puts on record is... Um, the issue about no conclusive proof. And he says this, you say that there is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted through blood products. I would argue that the evidence is very strong. There are now about 20 American haemophiliacs with AIDS, and this figure is likely to underestimate the risk because of the apparently long incubation period. Haemophiliacs in Europe, using US-derived products, are contracting AIDS in locations where the disease has not previously existed. I also draw your attention to a paper prepared jointly by DHS staff and the HSE, that's the Health and Safety Executive, I think, which was submitted to a recent meeting of the Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens. This paper states quite specifically that there is now strong circumstantial evidence that AIDS may be transmitted by blood and blood products. I am tempted to ask you what you would consider to be conclusive evidence particularly in the circumstances where the agent or agents for AIDS are as yet unidentified. Um, now, I think in your statement, um, and it, again, it goes on to address the Food and Drugs Administration um, uh, re recommendations, which I'll, I'll come back to, but you say in your statement that you don't think you saw this letter until early January when a, you were given the letter along with a draft reply. Could you give me the paragraph, yes, page course. number, please? Uh, of course. Let me just find it. Um, you deal with your correspondence with Mr Jenkins from paragraph 27, page 43 onwards. Um, and if we go to page 44... Let's put that up on screen, Shane. It's Ms. Lord Glenarth's statement, WITN 5282001. You say in paragraph 27.2, I have been asked about Mr. Jenkins' letter of the 27th of October, in particular the second paragraph. I am asked when I first became aware of the evidence referenced therein and whether it caused me to question or qualify the no conclusive proof rates. I would not have seen the letter itself until it was sent with the suggested reply presumably in early January 1985, since my reply was sent out on the 5th of January 1985. Can I just come in there? Yes, I think course. it probably should have said January 84 and rather than January 85. Yeah, yeah, yes, okay. you're right. That, that, yeah. A typographical error. Thank Type you for correcting yeah. that. Um, and then you say, I do not recall being made aware of the detailed situation in Europe, nor of the paper to the meeting of the Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens. Um, and then, um, just before we look at your letter in reply, you say at 27.3, I've been asked what steps I took to verify the evidence for the statements made. The draft reply to Mr Jenkins' letter was provided by officials for me to consider uh, and sign. Whatever was the detail of, uh, and that's the reference to the report to the Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens, which is not referred to in my reply, the strong circumstantial evidence indicates to me that it paralleled the term no conclusive proof slash evidence. 
um, you, you go on a couple of lines down to say, I do not recall taking any action personally, but I would have expected officials to examine the different terms used in the findings of the ACDP and to advise me if there was evidence of a real conflict or cause for concern, this was the normal process within government. Um, and just so that we can follow that through, before we look at your response to Mr Jenkins, let's just briefly look at the report that's referred to by Mr Jenkins, which is at WITN 5282009. Um, we can see the reference at the top in the top right hand corner and then we can see Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens, so that's what the ACDP stands for, uh, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome Background, uh, members will be aware of the considerable publicity and the degree of public concern that's arisen since AIDS was first recognised as an apparently new clinical condition. Uh, and then if we go further down, um, there's then reference to some of the um, information from uh, the, the state and, and the CDSC. And then the assumption to date has been that AIDS results from an infection which is most likely to be viral. Um, and then if we go to the next paragraph, and this is the passage I think that Mr. Jenkins refers to, there is now strong circumstantial evidence that AIDS may be transmitted by blood and blood products. Uh, and then the report goes on to refer to uh, haemophilia in the, in the States, confirmed case in Britain, three cases in Spain, uh, and cases, single cases having been reported in haemophiliacs in Germany, Austria, and Canada. Um, and then it says perhaps the most significant case in relation to blood transfusion concerns a baby who developed AIDS several months after receiving transfusions of blood and platelet concentrates. Lord Glenarth, just, just pausing there, that's a case that the inquiry is examined on a number of occasions. It's a case in the States that I think is being referred to here. It's quite often referred to as the San Francisco baby case, known about since December of 1982. Just, do you recall your officials ever telling you about that case? No, I don't. Uh, and then um, it continues uh, this report. One of the platelet donors was subsequently um, discovered to have developed AIDS, although he'd been apparently well at the time of donation. Uh, some other less well-defined instances of AIDS developing at long but variable periods after transfusion have been recorded. Uh, although in these cases no other predisposing factor has been implicated, neither has a direct link been established with a donor suffering from AIDS. Um, and then if we um, go down, the third paragraph refers to the guidance being issued for blood donors in the UK, so that's the leaflet. And then the next paragraph, in view of the circumstantial evidence for infectivity, in particular in relation to transmission by blood or body fluids, there is concern amongst healthcare staff about the possibility of contracting AIDS from patients or from contaminated materials and clinical samples for investigation. Um, and then... Um, if we go down a further four, few lines, but in the same paragraph, guidance for the conduct of laboratory work and for patient care and general preventative measures has been issued by the US Department of Health via Centers for Disease Control, and this was published initially in two editions of the Mortality and Morbidity Weekly Report. This is now available from the Communicable Disease Surveillance Center at Collendale in a combined form. Um, and then uh, referral to ACD. ACDP, although an infective etiology for AIDS remains unproven, it would seem prudent at this time for ACDP to consider the need to provide guidance for the safe handling of clinical and other material from patients who either have AIDS or are at risk from the disease. Um, and so um, uh, the context of this report, Lord Glenarfer, just so that it clear is, uh, but I think it's probably apparent here, the question that was being considered was should, should guidance be issued for the safety, safety of yes. staff, yep. laboratory clinical mm. staff um, who might become infected. So that, that, that's the context. Um, so you, you didn't look at this yourself? No, that paper uh, I, I had not seen. It was not drawn to my attention. Um, lo looking at it now and seeing what's set out there, um, strong circumstantial evidence, reference to a number of cases... Um, reference to the most significant case in relation to blood transfusion, the, 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 the baby um, transfused. Do you think if you had seen it, 
it might have at the very least given you pause for thought as whether it was it was right to emphasize the absence of conclusive proof yes i think it would and that's why as i think i said yesterday um a lot of things were beginning to come together and um no uh, sort of all-embracing um note for ministers uh, was produced uh, to describe the totality of all this and the the, 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 the um, mix of evidence that was emerging and what we ought to at least be aware of, even though there was nothing we could do about it, um, so that we were alerted. Uh, and, and that never happened. So yes, I, I mean, I think if it had been drawn to my attention, I would have asked uh, questions about it. Um, and then if we, um, uh, having looked at um, Mr. Jenkins' reply to you, if we then just look um, at your letter back to him, which is PRSE 00001727. Um, this is the 5th of January 1984. Oh, yes. um, from you back to, to Mr. Jenkins, um, you say, thank you for your letter of the 27th of October, in which you record a number of areas of disagreement with points which I made in my earlier letter. Let me deal with your paragraphs in numerical order. It remains the case that there is no underlying conclusive evidence of the transmission of AIDS through blood products, although the circumstantial evidence is strong. So it looks like that that formulation may have been influenced by the ACDP report that we've just looked it at. It looks like it. But essentially, this is the draft that was given to you. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, uh, is it right to understand you would have read it, thought it looks all right, and signed it, essentially? Yes. And, and are you able to assist us with why it's taken till the early January for a response to be drafted to, to Mr. Jenkins' letter? Uh, 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 I, his letter what was, was the date of his letter to me? 27th of October. Um, so that's three months. So uh, no, I have no idea why it took so long. Um, and then, just going back to, the, to this passage, um, uh, it continues these two statements in no way contradict one another, as you will readily appreciate from an analysis of a similar argument which you use in paragraph 7. Um, while there is strong evidence to suppose that the hepatitis vaccine will not transmit AIDS, the evidence is not conclusive and cannot be so until a means of testing for AIDS has been devised. Mm -hmm. In both cases, the conclusive evidence awaits the development of a test which can identify the AIDS agent. So it, it, it would appear appear from this that the the line of thinking within the department to which you were as it were putting your your name mm -hmm. in, in this letter was that by conclusive evidence they meant a test uh, yes they couldn't uh, they can they they couldn't be certain until they knew what AIDS was effectively and could um, be found yeah um so it's right to understand, isn't it, from this letter that as at the 5th of January, the department on this occasion through you is still maintaining that it's that the no conclusive evidence is an appropriate line to take. That seems to be the case. Albeit there's a recognition in this in response to yeah. Mr Jenkins that the circumstantial evidence is strong. Um, if we go back to then... Um, uh, the, the letter to John Maples MP, ARCH 000679. Sorry, Shamik, ARCH 000679. I, I, I omitted a zero. You will um, have been aware when you're writing this letter towards the end of 1983 that, that Mr. M you're engaging with Mr. Maples because he's raised issues on behalf of a constituent. Yes. So this is something that may well get passed on to the constituent. That, that would be a, a, a uh, normal that, course. I would assume, yes. Um, and then uh, if we um, look again at that second uh, paragraph where you say, I can well appreciate the anxiety... 
um, you say this, um, would first of all like to put matters into perspective. The cause of AIDS is as yet unknown and there is no conclusive proof that the disease has been transmitted by American blood products. Um, um, and the, it, the, the sentence begins by referring to anxiety. Um, th this was expressly intended to reassure, wasn't it? This, this, this sentence. Um, it appears so, but uh, I don't think that I have seen the letter that uh, Mr. Maples wrote to Kenneth Clark. No, I, I, I think that's right, um, uh, that you haven't seen it, and I, 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 I don't know without checking whether we have it. Um, um, but, but you refer further down to, uh, um, oh, sorry, the next sentence, nevertheless, I would like to assure your constituents. So we know at least it's, yes. it's arisen in the context of yep. the constituents' letter. <coughs> And it starts that paragraph by talking about anxiety and then uses the words, would first of all like to put matters into perspective. Now, that, that sounds as though it, it is designed to provide a degree of reassurance. It sounds like it is. And, and would you accept, <coughs> although this is now mid-December and although I didn't take you to the date of the um, Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens report, we know it was available by the 27th of October because Mr Jenkins had referred to it in his letter. So yeah. it's clearly available by the time you, th this letter's being drafted. There's nothing in here which contains that recognition in your response to Mr Jenkins, is there? No. That, 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 that there's a strong circumstantial evidence or anything along those, uh, along those lines? No, it's not contained within it, no. Um, before I just ask you a little about, about why you think this line of no conclusive proof or evidence was adopted, can we just look at how the line seems to have come to an end? Um, PRSE 0001580, please, Shomik. Um, this is an article in the Sunday Times... Um, dated the 25th of March 1984, New AIDS Alarm Over Blood Link. Um, it's from a uh, journalist based in, in, in the States, it would appear, by, this is by John Barnes, Los Angeles. Doctors now have conclusive proof that the mysterious and generally fatal ailment known as AIDS has been passed to a hospital patient through a blood transfusion. American health officials fear that this news will heighten the already widespread alarm about the risk of AIDS-tainted blood banks. The proof has come through a feat of medical detection. It began with a man suffering from AIDS, being admitted to a Los Angeles University medical center. He told health officials that before he knew he was an AIDS victim, he'd given blood at one of the city's leading hospitals. There, they learned that his blood had been given to two women patients. That was more than a year ago tests on the women showed that the dangerous abnormality that is evidence of AIDS, a failing of certain white blood cells that trigger the body's fight against infection. The women had to be told they were living with a time bomb. Um, next paragraph says, in December, one of the two 38-year-old um, uh, uh, Los Angeles women who was given the blood during a hysterectomy operation went down with pneumonia. Doctors managed to save her, but the outlook is grim. The other woman is still waiting for the first onslaught. Uh, next paragraph, most of the victims are homosexual men who contracted AIDS through sexual contact, but at least 79 are people who had blood transfusions, either haemophiliacs or hospital patients, some of them babies. The suspicion that the blood was to blame has now become <coughs> true. And the proof that's being referred to in this, and this is by a journalist, it's not, it, it's not a scientific yeah. paper, but the proof that's being referred to is the fact of a patient with AIDS having given blood and two people receiving the blood becoming infected. Yes, that, that seems to be yeah. being what's seems termed logic, yes. conclusive proof here. If, if we go to DHSC 0002239 underscore 089, what we see here is a minute um, dated the 26th of March, um, uh, uh, and it's um, addressed to Mr. Williams, 
Dr. Smithers, who was we established yesterday, was Dr. Wolford's successor, and Mrs. Cree, Cray, I think yep. it says. Um, and it says this, we dropped, there is no conclusive proof that AIDS is transmitted through blood or blood products from our standard line some time ago. Um, and, and I think the author of this is, is Green, Mr. Green, um, but uh, it's a signature rather than a printed name, so I can't be certain. Um, so 26th of March, um, uh, th there here is an internal departmental note. Um, we dropped, there is no conclusive proof um, some time ago. Now that's the best evidence we have, I think, so far that the line was dropped and by when, dropped by the 26th of March, doesn't, I'm afraid, help us in knowing when it was dropped. Did you receive any briefing or information or have any discussion about oh, this that you can recall? I don't recall any at all about it, no. Um, it, it was internal, it was between officials, and um, no doubt that change would have been reflected in any other comments that I was to make either in Parliament or in correspondence, uh, I, but I don't recall it, um, hearing about it or being asked about it. So, it, it, is, it, 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 is it right to understand then, as far as you know, and I appreciate the evidential picture is, 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 is far from complete, um, that, the, that this line to take, as it's called in internal departmental parlance, <coughs> um, has its origins um, back back in in May of 1983, with the, with the suggested draft for the prime minister, not not in fact used by the prime minister on, on that occasion. Yep. So it has its origins within administrative or med medical staff of the department. We don't know who. It, it's then a line which you and. I'll look with Others. other ministers yes. what, 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 how they use it, but it's certainly a line that you use in, yes. in the way in which we've seen um, on a number of occasions in, in, in some different fora, parliament, um, um, and, and in correspondence with other members of parliament, union official, MP on behalf of constituent. And then the decision to stop using that line is again a, a civil service decision, is it, rather than a decision that g goes to ministers? At least it doesn't go to you for a decision. I think I said yesterday that when it was first mentioned to me, and that would be during the June 83 uh, briefing for the parliamentary question on the 14th of July, or indeed with Dr. Wolford's briefing earlier, um, that uh, it, it would have been discussed. Why are we saying this, I would have asked, and uh, you know, what do you mean by conclusive, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I can't recall the detail, and none of it's on the record. But it was, uh, as is very often the case with, uh, with uh, certainly parliamentary stuff, there is a, a, line, a line to take. There are sort of, quotes, hallowed words that are, are used, um, said that there's some consistency about what is said. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure that the, this particular phrase was the one that was considered to be um, the, the, the correct line to be used, which ministered, ministers had accepted, albeit with a degree of qualification which varied from one case to another. Uh, but I do not recall uh, the change, and I don't recall anyone suggesting to me on any occasion that it ought to be changed. And it's only now, looking back, that I... Um, seeing um, uh, minutes within the department which removed an additional qualifying comment, which is the letter to Lady Massam. So I, I, no one ever came to me and said, we're going to have to change the line because of X, Y, and Z. It never, I, I don't recall it at all. And I don't, well, I, I can't speak for my colleagues, but... Um, and although in that reply to Mr Jenkins on the 5th of January of 1984, your, your response had tied um, the concept of conclusive proof to the availability of testing, yes. it would appear from this material <coughs> that actually the line is then abandoned 
um, despite the fact that testing is still not um, available. So it would appear, yes. And why do you think it was thought appropriate to use this formula of no conclusive proof, no conclusive evidence that AIDS is or can be transmitted through blood and blood products? I believe that it was considered a, a measure of reassurance that, if that's the right phrase to use, that we didn't know, or the experts didn't know, quite what was going to happen. AIDS was not understood. The causative agent of AIDS and how AIDS might progress was at that stage unknown. We were importing f factor eight uh, for the reasons that we discussed yesterday. There was insufficient here. A measure of reassurance, for right or for wrong, was thought wise to be uh, addressed to the community who uh, uh, required the necessary agents to treat their hemophilia. And until uh, there was proof uh, that that product uh, did contain AIDS and could be transmitted. There was a need to provide an element of reassurance, and that reassurance became weaker as more and more evidence emerged in due course that actually, yes, it could be. There was this this risk that it, 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 it was likely that it could be done, but the risk, even if it had been, the material had been used, which it was, was considered very small. So if you stitch the whole lot together as a package of an element of reassurance, but against, set against that, there was the alternative that if uh, people were not able to uh, have the factor eight to which it was attached, it is alleged, a very small risk. The risk to those hemophiliacs who were unable to get it was going to be infinitely greater. So we go back to the discussion we had yesterday about risk. And I dare say that uh, that was a point that I raised in discussion with officials at the time. So would this be right, that, that in part at least, the purpose of, of, of saying publicly um, 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 and in various communications that there's no conclusive proof, sometimes prefaced with words like I would like to emphasize or I should, I should first of all say and, and so on, in, in part was aimed at reassuring the haemophiliac community um, uh, because of an underlying concern that they might otherwise not accept treatment with concentrates, which you had been led to believe was a worse outcome for them. Yes, I think that interpretation could be put on it, yes. Um, Dr. Wolford told us that by certainly the beginning of 1983, in her own mind, she thought it was likely that yes. AIDS was transmitted by blood, blood products. Um, although, in fairness, I should say she, she, she also told us that she thought that, again, rightly or wrongly, will be a matter for the chair in due course, thought that the, the risk in terms of the numbers who would be infected was small. But she said she thought it was likely, and she told us that certainly by the time we're talking about July of 1983, it was mainstream acceptance within the department that it was likely. And I think you, in your statement, I can find the reference. Um, so I think it's paragraph 20.4 of your statement. 20.4. Yes, 
20 point four. Can we put it on screen, Chair Mick? So it's Lord Glenarth's statement again, Document <coughs> 528201, page 33. Um, paragraph 20.4. And, and just to put it in a chronological context, you are here answering questions about the leaflet, the first leaflet, and, and so we're talking about um, around August of 1983. Yes. And, and you'll see that further up that page, um, Lord Glenarthur, I know you've got a hard copy of your statement. Yeah. Um, uh, you're, you're being asked questions about, about um, a, a response of yours on the issue of the leaflet in, on the 3rd of August 1983. So around the time that the no conclusive proof line is, is simultaneously being used in, 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 in various ways. And the bottom of this page you say this, I've been asked whether at the time I thought that there was strong, there was strong circumstantial evidence that AIDS could be transmitted by blood product, products. My recollection is that there was clear evidence that AIDS could be transmitted by blood products, but that the risk appeared to be small. So you, I think from this, we can take, you shared the view Dr. Wolford articulated the, and what was her understanding of the general departmental view, that it was, there was a causal link. No, yes. Not an absence of conclusive proof in terms of the availability of a test, but there was a causal link. Uh, I, I, yes, exactly. We were on the same line. And so, why then did the department, in these various press release, parliamentary statements, not, not, not just by you, but by others, correspondence, um, wh why, why say no conclusive proof, rather than say, for example, we acknowledge that it is likely that AIDS is transmitted, or can be transmitted, or has been transmitted, through blood and blood products, mm. but, and then go on to set out measures of qualification. Mm. Why was it never put that way? I don't know the answer to that. Um, a lot of people must have been um, considering this at um, senior levels within uh, the department, both on the medical and the administrative uh, chains of command within the uh, department. Uh, I and others relied on, on, on that advice. Um, at some point, as I think I said earlier, I must have discussed this with, uh, with um, uh, Dr. Walford or with other officials and you know, was assured that that was the correct thing to say, uh, certainly up to the point that they changed the line. And um, so we, we, we all used it to uh, one degree or another. And I cannot say now, I do not know, I cannot recreate uh, in my mind or in any other way, um, the nature of the thought processes that went through ministers' minds or my own mind uh, in relation to um, what was apparently clear advice for what to say coming up from officials within the department. I, 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 I'm afraid I can't help any more on that. Would you accept that although no conclusive proof might have been technically correct, Yes. certainly if one's talking about testing being the, the yardstick for conclusive proof, that it wasn't an honest and accurate reflection of the department's actual understanding and belief, which was that it was likely that AIDS was transmitted through blood and blood products. Uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I mean, I don't, the implication that if, if you, if I've got your question right, that it wasn't honest in, in some respect. I, I believe it was thought by all concerned that it was fair. I don't know whether honest is the, quite the right word. It may now appear to have been incomplete. And indeed, um, there's plenty of stuff to indicate that there was a cautionary bit put after us. We're doing our best to make sure that it doesn't, uh, 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 there isn't a great risk growing out of it. I think it's a question of honesty. I think we were trying to describe the facts as we, we saw them, and that was being done by officials as well. And why it wasn't expanded, I, I honestly, 38 years later, can't go back to and describe fully. If we, if we put to one side the, the, my, my, my use of the adjective honest, your own answer just then was, I think we were trying to describe the facts as we saw them. 
This line didn't describe the facts as the department saw them, though, did it? Because it didn't say what was in truth the internal understanding. It's likely that AIDS is transmissible in this way. So it now seems, but uh, uh, that was not apparent at the time, to me anyway. If the department had been being open and transparent about its thinking at the time, mm. and, and transparency, openness, candor are certainly principles that one talks about in, in, in modern times, but um, if the department had been open and transparent and candid, it would have said, would it not, we accept it is likely that AIDS is transmissible by blood and blood products. And then it might then have been quite proper to add a qualification about the extent of the uncertainties or incomplete scientific knowledge at the time. Yes, if those phrases had been reversed in a sense from what we've seen in other correspondence, that might have made, um, made, it, made sense. But I cannot, I, 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 I certainly do not feel for one minute that what was said using those words was any attempt to mislead. It may have been incomplete to a degree, but uh, and, and that was the reassurance point that I referred to a few minutes ago. But it was not, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm absolutely certain that officials in the department, let alone ministers, would not wish to have misled in any way, but uh, lines to take in one form or another were, um, regular throughout virtually every department I've been in, so far as I know. If, if one leaves aside the question of whether there was a subjective intention to mislead, and I appreciate you no. can probably only speak to your, your, your own subjective intentions and not the subjective intentions of others. So leave, leave that aside. Would you accept that it, it, it was a line which clearly had great potential to mislead because it was partial? Well, uh, looking at it now and having seen, for example, the um, approach that the Penrose inquiry took to it and my response to that through uh, government lawyers, um, uh, looking back all that time, yes, I can see that it could have the, um, uh, created that, that, that sense. But it was not at the time, either by me or by anybody else that I'm aware of, a, a, an intention to mislead. It may have been incomplete. Uh, we um, accepted the, uh, the, 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 the advice that was given, which was essentially uh, one that covered a, a, a clinical area, uh, and um, the practicalities of so many other aspects of this particular um, problem, uh, th that we operated in this field on the advice of experts. And why uh, now the whole, um, the whole business hadn't been spotted higher up the medical chain of command within the department and called into question even at CMO level. Um, and uh, some view uh, from them, from, from him and his staff, had not come down the chain to the point where those that were dealing with ministers said, look, we can't use this any longer because it is incomplete or could be judged as incomplete. I do not now know. Uh, and then lastly, bef on, on this topic and before, before we break, you, you, you've accepted, I think, that, that part of the thinking behind the use of this line may have been because you didn't want haemophiliacs discouraged from, from continuing to take factor concentrates. Is it also possible that this formula was adopted because it, it helped explain or excuse why the department was not taking more radical action, such as banning the importation of concentrates or banning pre-March 1983 plasma? I'm not sure. I, I, I can't get into the minds of officials who um, who, um, who who came up with the formula and worked it through. Um, so I'm going to move on to another topic, and we're at our normal break time in any event. 
could, could you just just help me with this? Um, it, it's really going back to your paragraph 20.4. Shall I turn up? Thank you, Shumik. Uh, it's on the screen. Oh, yeah, 20.4, sorry, yes. Um, Page 33. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and th it's the, the second last sentence in Underneath Little One. There is growing public interest, if not a degree of alarm. The overall uncertainty indicated to me that it would be wise to plan for the worst. Just stop there. That's really saying, well, there's uncertainty about this. There's a, obviously a real risk whatever else, however else you may describe it. Yes. And this is born out of your experience in the, in part, in aviation, as I understand it, your personal view. Uh, in relation to risk, yes. So if the position was that um, it had been known that a, a plane uh, had developed a, a defect which uh, either had or, or came close to causing a, a crash, uh, and the engineers have been over the plane, so we can't find out what's wrong here. Is the general reaction of the airline industry to stop using that plane until there can be absolute certainty that it is safe? As, of, as opposed to saying, uh, well, we've got no reason at the moment to know that it's unsafe, we'll keep on flying it. No, that is correct, and that's where the analogy doesn't completely tie in, but it was my perception of risk, and in this case, as I tried to describe yesterday, uh, Sir Brian, the, um, uh, the, the, the was, uh, the, there were risks both ways. The absolute risk seemed to be, as was expla uh, as explained to me at the time, that if factor eight, even if it had risks attached to it, was not provided for haemophiliacs, there will be worse risks. Then they were in a serious trouble. Well, I, I understand that, 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 that was that my point of view. Um, uh, but the, it, it was considered uh, reasonable to continue because uh, the risk of importing factor eight and using it was considered to be very small. And the words have emerged several times over the last couple of days. So. He, Yes, I don't think anyone denies there was a risk. One with risk was greater than the other, and it's a very difficult position to be in. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, we'll take a, a break uh, now until uh, 10, to, 10 to 12. Thank you, sir. Thank you.